Hey everyone, hope you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel is Finding Value. Uh, today we're gonna go through Twitter, see what people are sharing on social media. I'll interject my financial opinions as we go through it, generally related to three different topics, wealth building, commodities, and or financial topics. So we're gonna dive right in, take a look, and see what people are sharing. Uh, if you wanna follow me, it's at Finding Underscore Finance, and if you wanna join our community, finding-value.com, I dive deeper into all of these sectors, topics, looking for potential investment opportunities in individual companies. Uh, and I share that with everyone in the community. If that sounds interesting, we have a coupon code MAYDAY that is active where you can get some savings signing up. The Trend Spider, we've got XLE, which is the ETF. Uh, energy stocks are breaking out with strong participation. Percentage above the 50-day SMA hitting multi-month highs. With rising crude production across administrations and global energy demand in focus, this could be just what the doctor ordered. Now, I just look at the chart. It's a pretty nice looking chart. It's a big flag pattern uh, coming up. And we've broken out of that flag pattern to the upside. Uh, we did have a retest here. That's what the retest is. And we are hopefully ready to go to the upside. We can also see that the market breadth is starting to break to the upside with that retest too which means we could be early in the move, That's ex as expected. Uh, but energy is looking really good uh, and inventories are quite low. If we look at the fair value of oil in relationship to history on the dot plot, we're about $8 undervalued. Uh, so everything's lining up quite well for energy going forward. Uh, here's one. He says, buying rich people's stuff from Facebook Marketplace really is a life hack. Wives want new stuff every season or force husbands to sell his hobby items. Um, I actually do this quite a bit. Uh, there are things like car parts that I like. There are things that I like that um, I look on Facebook and, and I can buy them for incredibly good prices. And it's usually from, guy, from guys selling their hobby items. <laughs> it's kind of funny. And you can get stuff for 50, 60, 70, 80% off of brand new pricing. And the thing was never used. So I find a lot of merit to this, to be honest. Uh, here's Dan. He says, if you want to reverse your biological age, read this. And I know it's not exactly pertaining to the three topics that I normally cover, uh, that is more in the financial realm, but health is definitely something that um, that I like to try to do. And just to touch on the, the, the eight here, lift weights using progressive overload, I do that. Improve cardiovascular system, I do that too. Eat nutrition dense diet, yep. Keep your body metabi metabolically healthy. Fix your sleep, yep. Create a positive, optimistic mindset, cultivate friendships and social life, and create a mission for your life or a purpose. Uh, here's a quote from Navel Ravikant. says, the more easily you get offended, the less intelligent you actually are. Um, I would actually agree with that. Uh, there are arguments I have gotten to in the past with individuals. Uh, it is almost impossible to get me really offended about anything. And after thinking back, those who did get offended pretty quickly uh, are generally less intelligent is what I would say. Coming up, Lion Jones advice in essence of effective risk management in trading. When you trade like every dollar is your last, you instill a discipline that prioritizes capital preservation over profit accumulation. This mindset forces meticulous position sizing, rigorous stop loss usage, and a deep analysis of risk reward ratios, mitigating the emotional roller coaster that often leads to significant losses. By focusing on protecting your capital, you not only extend your longevity in the market, but you also set the stage for compounded growth over time. Risk management isn't about avoiding losses entirely, but about ensuring they don't derail your financial journey. And I would say that partially, I partially agree with a lot of, a lot of that. Um, the one thing that it does focus 
in my opinion, is if you have limited capital to, to deploy, which, I mean, ultimately everyone ends up in that stage, no matter how much money you have, you have to choose the best opportunities. And the best opportunities are a combination of risk reward. So what, what I'm dropping, and I mean, it's not just risk reward, it's also the probability of success. Uh, the probability should be overweighted. If, if you have the chance, the slim chance of making a 10 bagger, we're talking, let's say it's a very slim chance versus an incredibly high probability bet that nets you a 3x. I would choose the 3x over the slim probability of success of a 10x. And that's where I think a lot of people mess up in portfolio allocation position sizing. They don't understand the probability of success for some of the companies. And, and that it's not something that is set in stone. And it's not something that you can measure very easily. You are playing in the field of gray. So these are things that you're going to have to determine off the top of your head, off of logic and reasoning when you're looking across a variety of opportunities. Uh, and then you have to look at the probability of success. Maybe it's a confluence of things that are occurring. Then you have to figure out, okay, well, this is a decent probability. Then what potential upside is there in this potential investment? And that's what you're you're balancing across. You're balancing all of those things. Uh, the better traders that I have seen, they don't look at just one aspect of it. So just as an example, you can take a high probability of success bet, but it doesn't return much, and then figure out ways where it can return more. Um, so if you have a very high probability bet and it, let's say it's in the bond market or it's in a, a, a large cap company or whatever it is, you could figure out ways to increase the leverage on that bet. So maybe you think oil is going to go up. Chevron's the one that you want to use the opportunity, which isn't a high leverage bet. And maybe someone borrows money against it, or maybe they use options, or maybe they, they do warrants if the company provides warrants or whatever it is to add leverage to the move. We've got Steve Burns. It says, how long did it take even market wizards to become successful traders? Marty Schwartz, it took Jesse Livermore, six. Uh, Mark Minaverdi, six years. Paul Tudor Jones took five years. Set a more realistic timeline. This is a professional endeavor. So that's how long it took for these traders who are successful to become successful. The best thing that you can do, in my opinion, is to reduce this time to become successful. The faster you can compound your wealth, the better you are. Uh, and that's the, the real question. How do I get better at investing? How can I reduce my lead time to becoming incredibly, incre incredibly good? And that is something that um, I was trying to do throughout all these years, but I didn't have YouTube. I didn't have all of these things at my disposal as easily as they do today. Dividend Growth Hustler says the situation isn't the problem. Your reaction to the situation is the problem. The person, the person isn't the problem. Your reaction to the person is the problem, is what Dividend Growth Hustler said. And I would like to disagree with this statement. Um, there's, a, there's many things. It, so it, it's, it's all about the conditions. And I... I interchange situation and conditions interchangeably. So the conditions isn't the problem. Your reaction to the conditions is the problem. Well, not necessarily. Um, it, it, the, the situation isn't the problem and your reaction isn't necessarily the, the problem. What I do in my life is to avoid a lot of the situations 
that could potentially become problems. So it's about avoiding that situation entirely. So for instance, uh, there's a lot of things that I don't do because I know that there's an increased risk to something. And, and something on the lines of that is I don't drive a lot at night because I can't, I don't see as well as what I used to. And the light sensitivity bothers my eyes more. Let's just say that's a potential thing. I also get a little bit more tired more easily as I've gotten older versus other times. So the combination of me getting more tired and my light, my sensitivity of my eyes to light at night puts me in a situation that I don't like. So I try not to drive often late at night and put myself in that situation. So the situation isn't the problem, but it is. If you can avoid this situation entirely, that is where you want to be. And it says your reaction to the situation is the problem. And it says the person isn't the problem, your reaction to the person. And you know what I do? I avoid the people who cause problems. I avoid going to certain locations at night because it's a high risk of crime. It's a high risk of altercation. So I just avoid the, 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 the issue in, it, in its entirety or where I can do that. And the same thing in investing. Um, Warren Buffett has a quote. It says, uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter how many pitches you take. It's not baseball where you strike out. You can swing at one where you're ready and the, the, the situation is good. So it's, it's, it's about avoiding all of the situations where things don't align in your favor. It's betting that people will use umbrellas only, and you're only betting when it's raining. It's predicting that the kite will fly, but you only bet when there's wind. Like that, that is exactly the whole situation and the conditions that I look for. I only invest when the conditions are favorable, not when the situation isn't the problem. And it's not my reaction to the situation. I only take pitches that I know are not looking as favorable as they could be. I only swing at pitches that I can hit that are waist high that I can put over the fence. That's all investing is. It's waiting for the fat pitch and then absolutely destroying the pitch. And here's another one. It says a perspective shift. It's never the situation. It's your thoughts about the situation. Master your mind. Master your life. It's simple but not easy. And I would, I would, I don't know if I differ, if I agree or di or disagree with this perspective shift, because I view that everything is about the situation. It's about identifying the conditions, identifying the situation, reacting to the situation, and taking advantage of the situation that the market is in. And it's about identifying that situation and taking advantage of it. And yes, it's your thoughts about it, that, and I agree with that. But it's, it, it, it's all calculated. And, and letting things go by that are not the perfect situation, not maybe not perfect, but a, a, a favorable situation. Here's another one. It says, whenever you think that some situation or some person is ruining your life, it's actually you who are ruining your life. It's such a simple idea. Feeling like a victim is a perfectly disastrous way to make you go through life. You don't want to be a victim. There's always things that you can do. And, and there are some things that you cannot change. The, the cards that you were dealt as a human being when you were born, like your parents in the situations that you're in with your parents, I mean, you just got to keep going forward. You got to overcome it if that is a problem. Billionaire market wizard Paul Tudor Jones teaches Trading 101. Okay, let's see what he's got to say here. He's inspiration hampered by the need to understand and rationalize why something should go up or down. You that becomes self-evident. The move is already over. When I got into the business, there was so little information on fundamentals. And what little information one could get was largely imperfect. 
We learned just to go with the chart. Why work when Mr. Market can do it for you? These days, there are many more deep intellectuals in the business, and that, coupled with the explosion of information on the internet, creates the illusion that there is an explanation for everything, and that the primary task is to simply to find that explanation. As a result, technical analysis is at the bottom of the study list for many of the younger generations particularly since the skill often requires them to close their eyes and trust the price action. The pain of gain is just too overwhelming for all of us to bear. There are a lot of things that are true in what he has said here. Um, one of the pillars that I have is technical analysis. The reason I use technical analysis is because you cannot gain the information that you can from the charts that you can get from news. News will never create that. Also, you are looking at unbiased data and price action. And if you have a good logical thought process, you can come to your own conclusions without the bias of someone else's brain getting in the way. And I, I've, I've got a lot of questions. Well, why did this go up? Why did that go down? You don't know the answer. In fact, you will never know the answer unless it is blaringly obvious, like an entire market sell-off and some event occurred. But most day-to-day -day action, you don't know the why. So what you know on a long-term basis is that earnings per share drives price growth. And what drives earnings per share? Well, a commodity price does when it goes up. It impacts the equities of that sector. If it's a service sector, the cost of their service going up impacts it. And that doesn't mean that it will 100% be more profitable, uh, but most of the time when the price of the commodity goes up, the equities are more profitable, unless there's major inflation in the system. So you're, you're wasting your time trying to find out the why when it doesn't exist. EJ says the average weekly paycheck has never been larger, but it buys less than it did in January 21. Put simply, we've gone backwards. So this is what nominal looks like. It's nominal here of the paycheck. And this is your real purchasing power declining. So you are below the real purchasing power in 2021 than you are today, even though your nominal paycheck keeps going up. They are stealing the wealth the purchasing power out of your paycheck. And this is what that is showing. They're stealing that purchasing power, real purchasing power out of it. The best traders of all time, what do they have in common? And here's some of the common rates over time. Uh, here's like Peter Lynch was 29.3. We've got Stanley Drug here's did 37% compounded. Jim Rogers did 38% for 11 years. Some of these other guys are way up there for a period of time, and I don't know how they got so high. They must have been using leverage, maybe. Victor, Victor Sparando did 72% for 19 years. I don't even know if that's real. <laughs> uh, here's some other ones in the 20% and whatever. Uh, of some really big names. Warren Buffett's at 23% for 54 years. Victor, I, I researched and studied a lot of his um, technical trading for Victor. And, and I, I learned a lot from him uh, in, in some of his, you know, in some of it, not all of it, but some of it. Daniel, Daniel says, the bond market does not believe the Fed. Bond, bonds are signaling inflationary and economic weakness risk is rising via Bloomberg. And here we are heading higher uh, in the bond market, the 10 year, 30 year, it's all going up on the long end, guys. All going up. I thought we were doing in, I thought we were doing interest rate cuts. Why is this going up? Because they are signaling inflationary and economic weakness. Risk is rising. Uh, the investing for beginner pod, podcast. So here's five proven ways to value a company. Discounted cash flow model, the reverse discounted cash flow model. We've got relative valuation, common size analysis, and asset-based valuation. 
they've got assessed, but it's asset. Uh, what's your favorite? What did I miss? Um, well, some of that does work pretty well, but when you're working in the commodity space, the discounted cash flow models are really hard to do because it relies heavily on the price of the commodity. So what you'll eventually do is you'll run this model based off of multiple um, commodity prices. And then you'll say, okay, if you think the commodity price is going to go here, this is what it roughly is. And then you want to look at the sensitivity of the cash flow uh, out in the future. This isn't about being perfect. It's just about finding out what companies could potentially have the greatest leverage to the price move. If you're in a commodity bull market, you want that leverage in the balance sheet. And that's really what it shows. It, you don't have to be perfect. You don't need to know an exact value. You don't need to know all of these things that people, I think, get too caught up in the numbers. They're too caught up in the numbers. You just want rough back of the napkin stuff that can get you in a ballpark. And then you can usually go back into history. And if the assets are relatively the same, you can see the price sensitivity to the commodity. And then you can, you can basically estimate which ones have the most leverage. And if you think a big bull market is coming, then you know exactly kind of these three or four companies have more leverage than these three or four companies. You invest in it and whatever you get, you get. Knowing a precise discounted cash flow model is going to get you absolutely nowhere. Because all of the companies that are well known, the Apples, the, the NVIDIAs, all of those, people are doing these nonstop evaluations of them in the market. The companies that you're going to get an advantage of are the ones that people aren't really looking at. And you want to go to a sector that people are not looking at and could have a lot of, let's say, uh, big rewards. And that's commodities right now is where it's at. No one's looking. So no one's running these big evaluation models on a lot of the, the assets, I think. Maybe some of the bigger companies, but definitely not the smaller ones. And that's where you find the disconnect between value and price. Uh, emerging market stocks just saw a weekly inflow of more than 40 billion, the most in history. So we're starting to see inflows into emerging market stocks. Um, and I would expect that to continue in the future, given where currencies are trading and how they're trading against each other. Uh, if we see a weaker dollar, emerging markets is going to really push it to the upside. Uh, and we would also see uh, commodities go up. And a lot of these emerging markets have commodities as producers. Porter Stanbury says, the Fed's 50 basis point rate cut and mission accomplished victory lap on inflation will go down as one of the biggest monetary policy blunders since Arthur Burns. Thursday's reading of September core CPI broke out to an 18-month high of 3.3%, of while consumer inflation expectations have spiked to the highest levels in 40 years. And yet traders in the Fed funds futures market are pricing in a virtual certainty that the Fed will cut rates once again in November. America's central bank seems intent on making the 1970s great again. This is their mission accomplished consumer inflation expectations break out to 40 year highs. And they're cutting rates. Uh, here's some, some quotes from some famous investors. He says, I'm not a person who is formally trained in investments. I didn't get an MBA. I didn't go to business school. Basically, I learned from studying Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, and I studied them carefully. And Manish, he actually is an engineer by trade. Funny how all, the, all these engineers are going into finance and making a buttload of money. Um, when we own portions of outstanding businesses with outstanding managements, our favorite holding period is forever. Warren Buffett. And one thing to ponder is, is your holding period long enough? Should we be holding these assets even longer? And Monish goes into that too. You should be holding it for at least a decade plus with these really solid companies. Um, that was one thing I messed up. I could have still been holding some of my original positions uh, where I could have held businesses that are far higher than where they were back then, is what I'll say. Some of them I was forced to sell out, but you know what? I still had an option to quit the company to keep those companies in my 401k. I did have that option to quit. And I should have done that. I would have made more money.
than working. <laughs> uh, Egon says, with debt up 82 times since Nixon closed the gold window in 1971, and GDP is only up 26 times, it is not difficult to see that the U.S. engine is running on empty. Whenever your debt is going up faster than your GDP, you have inflation. And that's what's occurring. That, that, that mismatch between debt and GDP growth is inflation. Patrick Karam says, one year later, I had to move the rocket ship out of the way as the price rocketing upwards after the breakout. This is the silver, the price of silver, rocket ship defined breakout has already broken out and it's moving. We're going to the moon, guys. We're going to the moon. Uh, here's cross-border capital. He's talking about the world central bank liquidity heat map. So he says, and the leaves that are red turn to green. Latest central bank liquidity heat map from our upcoming global liquidity index monthly update next week. The end of September, and it's all green, where liquidity is flooding into the system. Now, there could be a delay between the red and the, and the green and when that is felt in the system. So we could be coming out of a slowdown. And when this comes into the system, it may not be immediate. It might take some time. So that's that, that crossover between a slowdown to liquidity coming into the system and how things are bottoming in a lot of these commodity uh, areas. Peter Schiff says, Kamala Harris keeps telling voters that her plan to deal with rising grocery prices is to crack down on price gouging. But that will only increase the upward cost pressures on food prices caused by the inflation created by government deficit spending and Fed money printing. Yeah, it's a complete bunch of crap that she's feeding you. Price gouging has absolutely nothing to do because in a free market, if you're earning obscene returns, someone will undercut you and get into it. Price gouging in a free market is impossible to do. Uh, so what they're doing is they're just turning around and blaming all of the money that they are printing on the companies. That is completely false. They are the ones creating the inflation and causing the inflation. Uh, Peter is right. And that's where we're going to end it, guys. So that's what I've got for today. Give me a thumb up for the content. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, subscribe to the website if you'd like. Uh, and we'll catch you guys later. This is Finding Value.